Christ. My name is Marcus. Today I'm joined by Paul Kingsnorth and Carlo Lancelotti. Paul is an English writer who lives in the west of Ireland. He's the former deputy editor of The Ecologist and a co-founder of The Dark Wine Project. His non-fiction writing tends to address macro themes like environmentalism, globalization, and challenges posed to humanity by civilizational level trends. His fiction tends to be mythological and, and multi-layered. And Carlo is professor of mathematics at the College of Staten Island. Is on the faculty of the physics program at CUNA Graduate Center. While his pr primary scholarly work has been in non equilibrium st statistical mechanics and kinetic theory, he's also been active as a translator in Italian. In particular, he's published three volumes of works by the late Italian philosopher Augusto Del Noce, which have a significant impact on Del Noce's studies and it's drawn much praise. So, um, first of all, I suppose I just wanted to see what you have each found interesting in one another's work and we what intrigued you about having this conversation. If we might start with yourself then, Paul. Um, well, um, I can't say very much about Carlo's mathematics, so maybe, <laughs> we'll, st maybe we'll start with Del Noce. Um, I don't know really. I mean, it's, um, well, well, I do know it's the, it's the translation of the crisis of modernity that I'm, that I'm aware of and just Del Noce's work generally, and I'm, I'm very much a newcomer to it. Um, I only read this book several months ago, having heard about it in quite a lot of different places. Um, but it very much ties in with, uh, well, with my own interest, at, at which for the last 25 years or so have been writing about the same crisis. I'm not a philosopher, I'm not an academic, but I'm coming at it from the perspective of somebody who is seeing um, the technological uh, the technological world, technological modernity, whatever you want to call it, eating away at the, the web of nature and at what seems to be the remnants of the culture. And so I was, um, I wanted to try and understand what, what Del Noche had said about that decades before. And um, I can't say I've necessarily grasped the whole argument, but the book is a really good, um, it really opened up my thinking in terms of just what modernity actually is from Del Noche's perspective, and especially its relationship with religion and its relationship with revolution, I suppose. So that's been um, that's been really useful and interesting to me. Fantastic, thanks, Paul. Yeah, Yourself, Carlo? Oh, no, thank you very much. I mean, I'm familiar with uh, some of Paul's essays. I must confess I never read the novels. I have five children. I don't have a lot of time for fiction right now, but <laughs> I will get to it at some point. And, and I thought that his uh, piece on the notch was very insightful. He really captured the the crux of the matter, you know, that because uh, I think until recently, a lot of the, say, religious, Christian, Catholic, Orthodox responses to the current crisis were either moralistic or partial, you know, uh, moralistic means that, you know, you kind of are con concerned about people's behaviors, changes in sex, sexual, sexual morality or different things. Um, but there was not enough reflection on, let's say, the deeper philosophical issues, right? The deeper choices that drive also the moral behaviors and they drive the even the religious uh, choices that people make. I mean, uh, I mean the Noche was uh, very adamant that, you know, the, 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 the crisis is not just a crisis of a specific faith, but it is a crisis of what they call the religious dimension more generally, which is in, in a sense a crisis of rationality, of the human ability to uh, look at reality in its totality, in its depth. And I thought that Paul's piece captured that aspect very well. Well, good to, glad to hear that because I wasn't sure whether I'd got to the heart of it. So um, that's really useful to know. Um, and one of the things that really struck me about Del Noche in, in the in the book, in the fundamental claim he's making is that, well, tell me if I'm wrong, but um, progress, modernity, what he calls this new totalitarianism of science and technology is a kind of, it's a revolution against transcendence. It's a revolution against what we would call the religious worldview. And as you say, that's not, uh, necessarily related to one particular religion. I mean, it's fundamentally yes. it's fundamentally anti-Christian in the West because the West has been Christian, but it's 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 far more radical than that. It seems to be a desacralizing of the entire understanding that humanity has of the world. Would that would that be fair? Do you think? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, he, he likes to talk about Platonism in a broad sense. You know, he refers back to Plato. 
as the philosopher that in some sense discover the invisible you know the, i mean think of you know the 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 platonic cave that there is a world outside you know that the, <laughs> that the world is yeah. not just enclosed in the cave and so to him the modern world is kind of a return to the cave so to speak you know it's it's, it's what the pope benedict XVI called the bunker which is first of all a bunker of knowledge you know the positivistic uh, mindset in which only facts exist only what is empirically verifiable where everybody exists and so the dimension of transcendence is precisely what is invisible, but without which the visible does not make sense, right? I mean, the, the, the old trajectory of uh, classical Western Greek and then European philosophy was pointing in this direction. Reality is not sufficient. Reality is not enough to itself. And so if you take reality, life seriously, you come to the discovery, which is rational, of an overarching mystery, which is another way to phrase transcendence. And uh, so uh, the notion's view is that starting in the 19th century, people like Marx and Nietzsche were very different philosophers uh, in Kant. The, the, the attempt is that you don't just deny God, but you deny that there is any other world. You make this world totally self-enclosed. And in a sense, you know, the self-enclosedness of the scientific mind is, is a consequence. I mean, I'm a scientist myself, and I think that science is in itself a spiritual activity, if done correctly. But the ideology of, uh, you know, scientism is really a philosophical choice, a philosophical option, which is done fundamentally for religion reasons. I mean, in, in, in the book, the Noche quotes this French guy, Fondin, who who says that people who embrace scientists, they do it to cut off transcendence, not because they have such great trust in the scientific method per se, because people who practice the scientific method, they know very well where it, what it can do and what it cannot do. But it's more over the ideologues that kind of create an idol of the scientific method precisely to, in a sense, cut off the possibility of transcendence. That's it. Do you... Can I ask you a question, Carlo, as a scientist, as an academic scientist, do you find, uh, I'm just asking as an outsider, do you find it with, with say, your colleagues or in the, in, the, in the scientific world that you're in, do you find that there's an understanding that scientism is an ideology or is it just something that isn't even questioned or thought about? It depends. I mean, there are many people who understand it. And I think this is more clear if you look historically. If you look historically in the 19th century, you know, a lot of the great scientists like Faraday, Maxwell, they were all Volta in Italy, Pasteur and Ampere in France. All the fa founding fathers of modern science, they were not ideologically scientific. Most of them were Catholics. You know, Maxwell was a super devout, I think, Presbyterian and Ampere was Catholic, uh, Volta taught Sunday school. I mean, they were all people who practiced science. They did not have that kind of philosophical goal mm. to use science to, uh, to, uh, to cut off transcendence. I think it came later and it came from outside. At this point, it's so pervasive in the culture that many scientists buy into it. But I don't think that they buy into it more than the average intellectual the average secular intellectual I mean, um, it also depends you know there are sciences like math and physics that are more naturally platonic in the sense that you know uh, uh, if you are a mathematician you have to believe that there, that, that pi exists <laughs> in some sense mm -hmm. uh, in my observation uh, for example i don't want to criticize biologists but they tend to be more mechanistic biologists are more like people who disassemble an, a clock a watch to see what's going on inside there although not all of them but it also depends by discipline. If you look at the statistics, I think that typically uh, mathematical and mathematicians and physicists are more open to the existence of the immaterial than certain other disciplines. But mm. Okay, thanks. That's really interesting. Um, yeah, because it seems to me that there was something that Del Notch said. In fact, I think it was something you said in your introduction to the book that... Um, Marxism, Del Noche started off when he was younger, perhaps believing that Marxism and Catholicism could be reconciled somehow, mm -hmm. that you could take um, the kind of critique of capitalism that Marxism had and its desire for justice, and you could meld that with, with Christianity. And then he ended up in a position where he believed that Marxism 
required self-creation, that it actually required a destruction of the transcendent, that that was inherent in it, and that that's also inherent more broadly than, I suppose, in, in sort of modern leftish sort of progressive ideology, which is itself kind of scientific, scientific. Would that be right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that would be right. I mean, of course, in Del Noche's case, that happened because of uh, fascism. You know, at the yeah. end of the Second World War, people really wanted to oppose fascism and Nazis. And so the question naturally came up, then, you know, the enemy of my enemy, can he be my friend? And so Marxism, mm -hmm. in, in some sense, was uh, re-scrutinized. And for some Catholics in Italy and France, uh, they really hope to kind of strike a deal with Marxists in which Marxists would keep the social analysis, give up on the atheistic metaphysics, and uh, the Catholics would provide the ethical metaphysical input on top of the, uh, the Marxist uh, science of history, so to speak, the, the ability to you know, analyze history in terms of class struggles and all the theory they were hoping to rescue. Uh, and the notary, I was tempted by that, but very soon when he read Marx, he realized that in Marx, really, uh, atheism plays a very fundamental role in which, in a sense, there is no ethics, you know, there is not some kind of transcendent morality that requires social justice. Social justice, uh, there is a faith in the future that history will bring about social justice. But social justice, again, is not rooted in transcendence. Uh, it's rooted just in the direction of history, as the Nostra calls it. And so at the end of the day, for a Catholic, that's impossible to reconcile because uh, if, if history goes towards uh, <laughs> a different uh, outcome, then a Marxist has nothing to counter, you know, I mean, because, yeah. because ultimately there is nothing beyond history. Um, I, I will add one last thing is that, you know, yeah, the Noche course about atheism and says that atheism has these two dimensions, a scientific dimension and a politicistic, I don't know what, you have to make up a new word, you know, a political dimension, uh, in the sense that, uh, you know, you cannot be a serious atheist unless you're convinced that uh, there is nothing wrong with humanity. And that ultimately, unless you're convinced that with the action, we can kind of fix the problem of evil, because otherwise, you know, an atheist who, who believes that evil cannot be removed, it ends up being desperate. And there, are, there have been people like that, whom the Nietzsche called negative atheists. But the Nietzsche thinks that the superior form of atheist is an atheist that is positive, And so it must in deny original sin and a positive atheist must believe in the possibility of redemption through what action, but ultimately the redemptive action is political. And um, so in, in, to the Noche, uh, atheism has a deep political dimension, which people often don't comment also because especially in the English speaking world, as I always say, atheism kind of mature later than on the continent, so much so that, stopping from talking too much, so much so that even a generation ago, the, the prototype of the English-speaking atheist was essentially Bertrand Russell. You know, if you look at people like uh, Dawkins or um, Sam Harris or Hitch, Christopher Hitchens, they were kind of rehashes of Bertrand Russell, and, you know, with, with, with the teapot orbiting the sun and all that kind of silly things, in which, in a sense, takes seriously the question of God just to dismiss it and to say, okay, no, we, there is no evidence for God. But it does not deny that there is a question of God. To the notion that's kind of a Victorian inadequate form of atheism, while the more mature, more significant form of atheism that in a sense is taking over now in the English speaking world is the atheism that found its prototype in Marx in the sense that he, Marx understood that to be a serious atheist, you must become a revolutionary. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, that, that, that if you want to be a, a serious atheist is not just enough to deny God. You have to remove the needs that push people to seek God. People are oppressed, people are miserable, and then they create God to amend, to, to, to soothe their misery. In, so in order to deny God at the root, you have to believe that you can remove human misery. And so this immediately takes a political dimension. You see what I mean? Mm. Yeah, absolutely. And one of the things that really struck me as well with his argument is the notion that revolution, politics generally, but revolution particularly replaces religion 
in the, exactly. in the 20th century, hence you get fascism, you get communism, you get all of the, the kind of radical revolutions and the upheavals as everybody tries to do exactly what you've just said, which is fix the world with whatever revolutionary politics. Yeah, because because, right, because that, that, that was Marx's idea, that you would not deny God simply by burning churches, killing priests, mm -hmm. but by bringing heaven to earth, right? If mm -hmm. you can bring, if you can create equality, justice, and whatever, people will no longer ask the question of God. And so you don't have to deny the answer to the question, right? Yeah. Is it, is it too crude? to say that modernity is an atheist revolution then, in Del Noche's sort of perspective? Well, Del Noche would agree to an extent, he, he would agree that Del Noche is, sorry, that the modernity is the period in which the atheist phenomenon has manifested itself. And he wouldn't interpret that as this kind of, you know, domino effect that people, or with a sort of inevitability, in, that atheism must triumph in modernity. But he thought that at some point, you know, after Christianity became established in, uh, in Europe and the medieval Christendom was created, there had to be a critique, right? Because, uh, and, and that in some sense, modernity is the European critique of Christianity in its fundamental, not just uh, dogmas, but philosophical assumptions original sin, first of all, and, and the, the need for redemption, the need for grace, uh, the divine image of man and woman, you know, all, 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 I mean, modernity is certainly the period in which a critique of the fundamental Christian truth has come to the fore. In a sense, it's not surprising. It had to happen. Um, the Noche tends to disagree with the kind of idea that there is a certain logic that you know you start with William of Ockham and medieval nominalism and then or wherever you want some people start from Francis Bacon and then the new Atlantis some people start from the car some people start from you can start from somewhere and there yeah. oh if just somebody had somewhere. killed <laughs> yeah if just Ockham had been killed in the cradle this would not have happened and and then that and that then now bad ideas of this kind of mechanical logic so that at the end of the day it is must prevail the logic would disagree with that it is my prevail it looks like right now it looks pretty bleak mm. but it's not because there is an internal necessity that's the atheistic vision of modernity the atheistic vision of modernity is that modernity has this intrinsic logical um necessity such that uh, it must conclude in disaster and that's why in a sense it's a secularist argument that we incarnate the direction of history uh, del noche would not go that far he thinks that you can have a christian acceptance of this direction of history on the negative side which is say oh this direction of history is a disaster but we still there is a direction of history del noche doesn't think that there is a strict direction of history in that sense it means that secularists can be criticized or even refuted uh, it's not necessarily going to prevail mm. oh, that's interesting sorry mark we're slightly hogging your podcast here aren't we no that's the sort of yeah. what i wanted <laughs> to worry about <laughs> <laughs> um yeah sorry go so um i just wanted to ask one thing in relation to what you just said carlo just as you were speaking, it, it struck me. Um, I suppose from Del Noche's perspective, then, why does there seem to be such a radical swing between, say, transhumanism on the one end and kind of harsh antinatalism on the other? Or harsh what? Kind of antinatalism, as if, a, if we could only get rid of human beings and let nature oh. take over, then we'll be fine. Doesn't make any sense. Well, I mean, the notion, of course, uh, he died too early to see that kind of antinatalism. But remember, there is that interview I put in the in the appendix of the book where he noticed that already in 1984, people in Italy did not want to have children. And um, I mean, I, I think I think the root of that problem is that anyway, our society, as he says somewhere, cannot make a sharp distinction between human and beast, first of all, human and animal. So in a sense, you know, the, the, the humanity does not have a specific value that differentiates it from the rest of the natural world. But more deeply, 
he also thought that there is this, uh, you know, Gnostic stream in modernity, Gnostic streak, Gnostic streak in modernity. Uh, there is this idea that of rebellion against being, in a sense, you know, that there is this idea that, you know, the order of being is uh, oppressive. Nobody asks for our permission to be alive. And, 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 and so, in a sense, the, from, uh, and to suffer. And since uh, modernity does not accept that suffering originates in, in some original fall that will require a redemption or a redeemer or grace, the only explanation of evil is a kind of individuality. And the, only, and the Gnostic answer is the dissolution of individuality into the sea of beings, right? So why do you want to preserve kind of your individuality to your children? It's kind of a selfish thing to do, right? So to, to a Gnostic, even in antiquity, uh, reproduction is bad because reproduction participates in the, in the perpetuation of the bad order created by the bad god, you know, the demiurgus or whatever the Gnostics you, used to call it, right? And, and in some sense, so this rebellion against this bad creation, this rebellion against this uh, uh, bad world, and the expectation of a new world takes a destructive aspect, you know, that it's better for this world to die for the new world to come. And so this is why traditionally these kind of Gnostic movements are anti-reproductive, so to speak, right? Yeah, I think right. There's, another, um, there's another aspect to that as well, which interests me, um, because I came at this, com I came into the critique of modernity, if you like, not through religion, but through environmentalism. I've, I've become a Christian fairly recently, but I was an, act, an environmental activist for a long time um, because I could see, I could feel, I could intuit or sense that there was something sacred in the natural world and I could see it being destroyed and I didn't really know how to put that into words or what to do with it. And, and I sort of explored that for a long time. And I think that what you call this kind of anti-natalism, Mark, which is there's a lot of people just saying, oh, I just don't want to have children. The world is so awful. I mean, there are lots of reasons for it, but a lot of it, actually, I think it stems from this desacralization that we've been talking about. Because if you see, again, correct me if I'm wrong here, but if we have a broadly a pre-modern worldview which sees nature as sacred, which sees the world as sacred, which sees us in, in some form of communion with something higher than us, which can be experienced in, in life, in the natural world, in the rest of life. If we have, if we have created in modernity a worldview which tells us actually that's not true, the whole world is just a material thing. It's just a machine. None of it matters. Um, so we can take it apart and we can do what else, whatever we want with it. Then we look around us and we see the destruction of forests and the poisoning of oceans and we see the, the these enormous mega cities and the pollution of the the sky and the changing climate and we can feel within us that something terrible is happening, but we don't have the language to speak about it because we're told that this is all legitimate there's some sense that something um sacrilegious is happening and you hear this with a lot you feel this with a lot of environmentalists they're people who can who feel despair at what's going on because they can watch this destruction that this civilization is meeting out and we're being told all the time that it's fine because of progress and growth and so there's a sense that that, that the kind of the desacralization of life and the desacralization of nature leads to this kind of i think this anti-natalism as you call it this sort of despair this like why bother the world's awful because we don't have the language anymore to talk about these things that have a, a real impact on people which again seems to me to be related to this modern way of seeing everything's a mechanism yeah i think so yeah, i think that's, that's part of it too i mean that's interesting because the notion emphasizes that we are in a post-christian culture in the sense that is not that Christianity did not have an impact. The most visible impact is that we still feel ourselves as transcendent to nature, right? Mm. While for a, for a classical pagan, uh, in a sense, you know, humanity was organically inserted into nature and participated in this cosmic uh, organism. We still believe, I mean, the, 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 this kind of scientific technological hubris is kind of a secularization of the Christian idea that human beings transcend nature, mm. that kind of the, the stewards of creation or whatever, and, 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 and they are the image of God and, and whatever. But it's very interesting what you say, because it looks like for a modern pagan, he has a hard time recovering the sacredness of nature because he's still kind of imbued with this Christian sense of 
superiority maybe it's fading away i don't know but i think until recently it was still pretty strong and so nature rem rem remains dumb essentially mechanical right? mm -hmm. it remains something essentially extrinsic and mechanical that we can manipulate and then when there is all these uh, ecological disasters uh you have a kind of a mechanical answer. Let's get rid of people. <laughs> mm. Yeah, that's <laughs> that aspect but, but, to it too, yeah. Well, it's right, interesting. But, I, see, I could see two different things. I can see on the one hand, a lot of young people, especially becoming very pagan. You know, there's a lot of, lot of neo-paganism, a lot of uh, sort of vague nature spirituality amongst young people because I think exactly because they want to try and somehow feel embedded again. And then as you say, then there's the the kind of the, the spear point of the culture, which is heading right towards this kind of Silicon Valley metaverse, transcendence, this very Gnostic, like you say, it is a very kind of weird perversion of a, it looks to me like we're, we're, we've become as gods, as we were told to in the garden in the first place. And now we're going to create our own heaven. We're going to create a Silicon heaven. We're going to upload our consciousness into it. We're going to, we're going to, I mean, the, the people in the, tran, the transhumanists in Silicon Valley talk very openly about building God and making God and becoming God. And precisely, I've heard this language again and again from these people about how, you know, the world is imperfect, they say, and we're going to, as you say, improve it with technology. And it feels like it's the end point of all of these trends that Del Noche identified in modernity, that we use technology to effectively create a kind of eternity. And then we build, we build an AI or we rebuild our bodies at the nano level so everything becomes completely new. We become the gods. We we recreate ourselves, or we even create the species that replaces us, which some of the some some of the transhumanists are keen to do as well. Yeah, but uh, on the other hand, there is also again the political side. There is the political side of it is, which in some sense, uh, science has to be put at the service of political projects like equality, mm. um, equity. Diversity, I mean, which are all words that can have a reasonable, good meaning, but when they become ideological, typically science has to uh, step aside, right? I mean, I, it's it's there, there. It's not monolithic, you know. There is not just one modern movement. I think that we just point out two that are kind of different, right? I mean, the the kind of the singularity kind of guys ultra scientific uh, silicon valley kind of guys are not the same as the uh, say academic uh, leftists to kind of walk kind of types mm. um, the, these different aspects are always uh, kind of feeding into each other but they cannot really be reduced to each other right so i mean i i, I don't I, I personally i don't think that we want to uh, live in the obsession of a monolithic adversary in some sense. You know, there is. A, I think that what's going on ultimately, the Noche argue was a process of disintegration, mm -hmm. and this process of disintegration uh, takes place in some a few different ways that are often conflicting with each other. <clears throat> That's why. I think one important lesson I learned from the notch is not to obsess in opposition to this uh, juggernaut that cannot be stopped, but to diagnose, to diagnose and then focus on presenting a positive proposal because otherwise one can become obsessed with, uh, you know, with the bad guys. <laughs> yeah, it's usually done. Gaze into the abyss. Yeah. So that's, a, that's interesting to me. So, what do you think? Is it easy? Is it possible to summarize what Del Noche's positive proposal was? What he thought could be done about? Well, I mean, Del Noche, Del Noche was theory. Catholic, and he thought that uh, what was necessary was a reaffirmation of what he called classical metaphysics, which is a bit of a philosophical, intellectual formulation that meant uh, to you know reaffirm human reason, the capacity to ask questions, the question of meaning, to, uh, to, 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 uh, to appeal to people's humanity, because people, they desire meaning. They desire to be rooted, as Simone Weil would say. You know, people have a need for roots. People have a need for beauty, for meaning, for justice. And uh, 
this can be proposed. You know, I mean, the, 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 the Christian experience has answers to these needs and they can be proposed. I think that the Noche would basically go along those lines. There is not, you know, a magic bullet, like a magic conceptual bullet that we finally refute what went wrong with, again, William of Ockham or the card. And, and, and then after we refute it, we start the evil system will start unwinding woo, and we will go back to to the 13th century it's not going to work out that way one 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 has to uh rediscover the eternal things in a new context by appealing to the locus to the location of of, of the of the of the eternal questions which is the human heart you know and I mean, I you know I, I think I told Mark the other time we had a podcast that when I grew up I was very much influenced by uh, the Italian theologian Fred Giussani. Fred Giussani was a high school teacher in Milan back in the fifties, and he had this idea that really you cannot propose tradition in a formulaic way. You have to propose tradition as the answer to certain questions, and you have to reawaken the questions by a shared experience of life. I mean, I don't know if the Nietzsche says that, but I'm thinking he will agree. Mm. Yeah, I think I mentioned, I think in the essay I wrote about Del Noche, I also mentioned René Guénon, and he's quite critical in the crisis of the modern world. He's pretty critical of the notion of traditionalism and traditionalists, actually. Despite the fact that he's regularly called a traditionalist, he's very critical of this notion of just um, creating this rote, almost political category of traditionalists who seek to return to a particular thing. And he's relentlessly digging away, as you say, at the notion that it's an inner... It's an inner search. It's a, it's it's something that comes down to what ha- what's happening in the heart. That's where it, that if you're going back to anything, that's where you're going. Yeah. So you're not trying to return to a period in the past. You're going inwards, actually, okay. to find that eternal truth. Yeah, tradition was tradition started with people <laughs> who were seeking God. You know, I mean, I the, uh, there was that beautiful talk by Benedict the Sixteen at the college, the Bernardin in Paris in which he talked about the monasticism of the Middle Ages and said people did not start from tradition. They started from the quest for God, querere deum in Latin. You know, they were seeking God. Uh, then if you seek God, you will also rediscover tradition because tradition is simply the summary and the condensation of what people figure out in their quest for God. You know, I mean, if people were not seeking God, they would not have created a tradition. That's where tradition mm-hmm. comes from. Tradition mm-hmm. comes from the human desire for the eternal. If you don't have the desire for the eternal, tradition will die Anyway, you know, that's my mm. point. So, yeah. so, sorry, go on, Mark. Sorry, Paul. So hey, something that I wanted to ask in line with what you just described there, how we embody this eternal element, say, at the level of the nation state, building upon some of your recent essays, Paul, I want to ask, um, I suppose, especially in light of what's happened in Italy and the kind of reactionary posture of the the elites against what they're portraying as fascism I, I don't know a lot about this lady but from the victory speech that i heard she was quoting gk testerton no better guy to talk about tradition properly understood things like that it didn't sound like fascism to me so i wanted to ask a little bit about um what's good and bad in nations and how could we live that national life today convivially as it were as we sort of start off in our recent conversation with the prairie and ben Burpo. Um, me? Yes. Yeah, well, I really don't know. Uh, I don't know anything about Italian politics, so <laughs> maybe Carlo, we better talk about that. Um, I, I, I do, but it's not something that I would, not a high priority, but go ahead. Yeah, I mean, also, I would say, I mean, look, it's, it's interesting because I was just, I just written an essay about um, nationhood and belonging. And um, one of the things I said in there is I'm always conflicted about these things. But I think that there, it's very easy, and I think it can be, it could be a trap to tie up your well to tie up your national identity or your worldly identity at all with this what we're calling the search for tradition because it starts inside and it's really really easy and you see it a lot now um, for people to say there must be a political solution to this right we've got this crisis of modernity everything's disintegrating we have a culture which is very clearly coming apart at the seams in a lot of ways so there must be a political solution and that political solution can look like well it can look like a reassertion of the past and that's not necessarily a bad thing in itself but one of the things i tried to say in that essay i've just written about 
nations and it's again it's something else Rene Greenland said actually is there's there's not a lot of point talking about your nation if you don't know what it is you know if, if it hasn't got a spiritual core to it if it hasn't got a purpose if it hasn't got a some sort of meaning then what is it is it just a kind of reactionary form is it a static form is it something you're you know what are you actually talking about when you talk about any any group any political um ideology any any notion and that seems to me to be the thing that it's easy to ignore because a political answer is quite easy um because you know you you do identify the bad guys and then then you go for them and then you get into your group and that's easy but it looks to me like that i just think i i come back again and again and again to this this idea that the as we were just saying we have to go in we have to go inward before we go outward I think that's what what it comes down to. So I don't know what to say about Italy. Um, certainly, any kind of national politics in Europe that asserts any kind of family or community or Christian tradition is going to be relentlessly, immediately attacked, which is obviously what's just happened. Um, but yeah, I don't know. I, I, I mean, I couldn't, I couldn't see beyond that really. I don't think. I just. I, I also think that's not the arena in which the kind of the actual struggle is going to happen. But Carlo might have a better better idea of what's going on than me. Well, I mean, the problem with the, um, the lady in Italy, Meloni, is certainly not fascist. I mean, it is true that she was, in her youth, she was linked with this kind of party that descended from fascists, but uh, um, it was more of a folkloric kind of thing because uh, she was 19, you know, at the time in, in Rome, the... The popular thing to do was there were different groups or communists. If you are not communists, we're the cool kind of tough guys. They were on the right wing, you know. I mean, it, 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 it is not something which has a deep philosophical significance, in my opinion. Um, but uh, the truth is that you know nationalism has the same problems that you mentioned about traditionalism. You know, it's an is. And so it can become an ideology. What does it mean? The notion says that somewhere too, that uh, nationalism puts the traditional at the, at the service of the nation and not vice versa. I mean, that, you know, what constitutes a nation? What constitutes a nation is some kind of founding ideal. You know, I don't know. For America, think of the Puritan idea of the city on the hill, right? The, the New Jerusalem, okay? That's an ideal. I mean, it could be fallacious or unrealistic, but it was rooted in the Bible. Or, or if you think of, you know, Russia, the idea of the third Rome, the idea that the, the great uh, tradition of uh, uh, Christianity of the apostles is translated from Rome to Byzantium to Moscow, right? This is a national idea. Or you, you can look at Fra most of European nations, you know, the baptism of France, Clovis, or, or you can think of, uh, you know, Ireland, I guess, St. Patrick, I don't know what would you qualify as the source of a, a sense that we are together because of some founding uh, value, of some, some founding idea. And you can see that the nation is at the service of that. The nation, in, in a sense, propagates, right? I mean, if you, if you I mean, if you, you, know, you know, Italy, you could, uh, there is a whole narrative that, you know, you have Dante and you have uh, St. Francis and you have the sense of this melding of the Roman and the Germanic traditions in, in, under, in Catholicism, right? That's a national ideal, okay? And so, and so to the notion, a healthy, rediscovery of the ideal is what keeps the, na the nation alive. And the notion used the word Risorgimento, which was the 19th century Italian unification movement, in a philosophical sense, it says Risorgimento means that you rediscover more deeply what motivated people to view themselves as united in a nation, right? You, you, you rediscover what was, was the source of original unity that made the nation the nation. Um, now, the notion that in the modern world, this dynamic gets inverted. And you have this idea that in order to preserve your identity, you need the nation. And then in order to support the nation, you have religion. But you see that religion that should be the beginning comes at the end. You see what I'm trying to say? Because mm -hmm. then what you do is that, uh, say that you're Irish and you want to preserve Ireland, you have to be very clerical. Maybe this was maybe back, I don't know. I don't know Irish history, but uh, maybe in the 20s and 30s, uh, 
people may be at this idea of catholicism as the back the the, the the mean to unify the nation or you could do the same for uh, you know russia today orthodox the 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 pope, the, the, whatever, the, the, the patriarchal uh, blessing the tanks or whatever it does, it, you see that orthodoxy becomes an instrumentum regni, you know, uh, what's the English for that? Uh, uh, instrument of... Uh, of the state, really. Of, uh, ultimately, of, of, su- of sustaining a power, the power of the country. So it's very important not to, not to invert that logical order. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah that's really interesting, actually. It's... Um... It just made me think as you were speaking, if, if, if we're at a time when we need to go within, then that's probably true of nations as well as people. Um, it, was really, it was really striking to me, and I just wrote, again, I, I wrote a little piece about this last week, because we had obviously a queen, the Queen of Queen Elizabeth died um, in Britain, and you know, she'd been on the throne for so long that even, even my mother, who's in her 70s, could barely remember any, anyone else. Um, and so she was pretty much the only thing holding the country together, to be honest. The only yeah. thing that unified people, even people who didn't like the monarchy, had some respect for the Queen. And so we had this funeral, um, and I watched the whole thing. It lasted all day, and it was an astonishing funeral, actually, really amazing. It's been been planned for 50 years. But in terms of, of the, the ceremony and the pageantry, but also the openly religious, the openly Christian Church of England aspect of it, it was a form of Church of England kind of ceremony that you just don't see anymore in England because most people don't go to the church and it was it was almost a, it, it felt very much like a farewell to something it was like it was already a hang up, hangover of something that the Queen still believed in but nobody else did really and so there was this sense that you suddenly I got a glimpse of the the sort of the founding story of the country because you know England grows up with the church with the Church of England right from its beginning um, and it was this there's this mythic even if it's not real anymore there's, there was this sort of ceremonial notion that the na- that the queen was in service to the church and the nation is in service to god now that's not real anymore <laughs> but that was that was the symbolism of it and it was very interesting to see that and like you say it is you do get um you do get in some circles this notion of cultural christianity which i don't like at all this um this idea that if we want to preserve the, the West, we need Christianity again, but we don't really believe it, but we'll go to church and sort of pretend that we do because somehow it'll keep the West alive. And like you say, it's a, it's an inversion of, of, of the thing that you need. And it seems, I don't know, maybe there's something going on with the disintegration of nations that that's prompting us back to actually ask the question of what what is at the heart of everything again? What is it that's lost? Yeah, I mean, you know, p- p- people perceive that... Uh, uh... Without a religion, there is not a society. Okay, I'm going to put that very bluntly. Mm. I mean, and by and, and by the way, what what I said before is uh, I was quoting a 19th century Italian philosopher named Rosmini. who wrote a book called "The Summary Cause for the Stability or Downfall of Human Societies," and his thesis was exactly that right, a human society is stable or falls to the measure that he's able to stick to the original ideal. Input, you know what I mean? The original kind of spiritual input that made it a society. By contrast, the Nodja thinks that modern Western society is what he calls a non hyphen society. I mean, there is no unifying ideal or religious principle. So, in some sense, it is destined to fall as such. Uh, as soon as certain material, economic, political arrangements are no longer relevant, it will fall. I mean, uh, the point is that a human society can reaffirm itself only by a rediscover of a spiritual root of some sort. I mean, to me, that seems unquestionable. Uh, and there, but society can also die. I mean, <laughs> okay, maybe, maybe there is still people living in that geographical area, but at some point uh, there is going to be either a new society or just chaos. But I, 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 I don't think that you know there is this kind of, uh, especially in America, sociological optimism that societies people will always uh, live together because you know they have jobs and they have cities and they have. That, that's not obvious, you know. I mean, it just mm. things can take a turn for the worse if yeah. it's all this atomized. You know, if there is no real interest in living together, if when when people don't need, they want. I mean, but anyway. 
Well, when I look at when I look at Britain, and actually when I look at Ireland too, although I've got a lot less experience here, and it's happened later in Ireland, but when I look at Britain, I can see that the the only thing that really holds the country together is is economic growth, and the belief in economic growth. And if you listen to politicians, I mean, they're all having their party conferences at the moment. All they can talk about is growth. They've got nothing else. That's it. They don't they don't know what it means or how to get it. But it doesn't matter if you're left or right. You just you just repeat this magical word: growth, growth, growth. And it's as long as that puts out some form of affluence, then people sort of sort of right. hold together. But Del Noche also said the Af- Af- the affluent society would lead to this new totalitarianism, as he put it, which is clearly happening, where you have this, you know, this scientific technological control system, effectively, which mm-hmm. is holding people together in the absence of any spiritual core at all. And so you can tell a story about a nation based on growth. It's all held together by this system, but it isn't. It isn't real. There's nothing. There's nothing at its heart. Yeah, you need some sort of leviathan. <laughs> yeah, you, basically <laughs> and, you do, uh, yeah, and that's the, that's uh, the state and the technological system that's attached to it. Yeah, exactly, but uh, if you, if you had a very very bad economic downturn, all bets are off. You know, I mean, yeah, it's... which may be happening. So, uh, but it could also be that, that that collapse when it comes or it probably comes in a staggered way does what oh, I think is already happening, which is it, it's, it opens up people to that search for God again, to that search for truth again, because they look around them and they say, none of this is real and none of it works and there's no meaning to any of it. And you can clearly see that amongst a lot of younger people now, especially who are just looking around and saying, what is this? There's no meaning to anything. That's why people are probably attracted to um, so-called outsider or populist politicians, because they say that as well. Whether they mean it or what they can do about it is another question. But the the, the sort of the utter meaninglessness, the void at the heart of the giant technological leviathan is so obvious, it seems to me, that it starts yeah, I mean, to people go on, go out seeking again. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's why uh, one, of course, has to do, say, political opposition to some of the worst outrages, how do you say, the worst and terrible things that come out of these uh, raging ideologies. But ultimately, that, that's, that purely negative response is not sufficient. I mean, you, you need a reconstitution of community, a reconstitution of life. Uh, and again, that can only take place around shared ideals, a shared quest for God. Without that quest for God, uh, there is no society, ultimately. That seems, again, to me, seems out of unquestioning. Yeah, so it feels like you have to have, as you say, you have to have a line of defense against the worst that the machine can throw at you and the worst that the ideology oh, can throw at you. And you have to you have to stand for truth and you have to fight against the things that are clearly yes, wrong. But, but you but say, at the same I'm, time, I'm, I'm, you say that's not enough, you have to. It can also backfire. I mean, uh, in America, there is this enormous, in the US, there is this enormous political polarization. You know, mm, I mean, oh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, yeah. Uh, 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 and people are consumed by the struggle, you know, and, mm. and if you leave consumed by the struggle against uh, uh, the, the, the Moloch uh, on the other side, uh, you are part of the problem to some extent. You know? Yeah, completely. <laughs> I mean, it's also the danger of putting too much faith in politics. And, yeah, you are putting too much faith in politics, which again, politics, when politics is repla- replaces religion, I mean, Again, you, you cannot uh, use religion as an instrumental, as a tool, as a tool to reconstruct the police. You know, you have to believe it. Either there is this personal quest, this personal search for the truth, uh, and then that has political repercussions. But if you try to reestablish religion, like, you know, Maurras, the, the, the Action Francais, Maurras was an atheist uh, who had a political party entirely dedicated to reconstituting medieval French Christendom. <laughs> mm. it, 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 I mean, it, it doesn't work that way. You know what I'm saying? I mean, it, 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 because either there is an experience of truth, an experience of beauty that brings people together or it's just politics again and you may have your politics may be better than the other guy's politics i'll give you my vote and I, 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 I okay i will but but if you spend your time obsessing about uh, you know i mean think of you know in a sense 
Nazism was a bit like that. Nazism was an obsession with the, the Russians are coming, you know, the, the Bolsheviks are coming. In its root, there was that that kind of fear of the of the East. But if you push that too much, then you can become a little more like that. You know, if you if you if you instrumentalize values for the political fight, then there is this uh, what I call a Sarumanian conservatives. You know, like Saruman, mm. the guy in, in the Lord of the Rings, that you try to use the ring yeah, for yeah. the good. Mm. The ring cannot be used for the good, right? I mean. Uh, <laughs> Exactly. No, the ring. The ring has to be destroyed. It's the only thing you can do with the ring. I mean, it actually the converse. The converse picture to the one that you just talked about with politics, I suppose, would be the Christianizing of the Roman Empire, which happened precisely because the Christians did not try to politis- to Christianize the Roman Empire. They lived as Christians, and then and then look what happened. They were invited effectively by the emperor to. Yes, yeah. and this happened historically in other places. Historically, it happened. I don't know the reducciones of Paraguay or. The conversion of different countries, you know, the, the Philippines, South Korea, you know, Korea's Christianity was a, a profound renewal uh, that at some point took a life of its own. But, you know, that's why I personally am not an integralist. People have this idea that in some sense, Constantine created Christian. Constantine started using something that had already gelled to some extent and that had to become also political and it was fine that it became political because all human unity and experience uh, must have a political expression there is nothing with having a christian empire in principle but you don't have a christian empire starting with the emperor and going down it works the other way around you know what i mean Mm. yeah the story of ireland actually is is interesting um Mark will know much more about it than me, but St. Patrick famously, I mean, Ireland famously is a country that was converted with no bloodshed. It became Christian without any warfare on either side. And St. Patrick famously also was the, was a former slave, a former British slave who was just sent over here. It's kind of a last ditch. And then I don't think they expected it to work very well, but he just came <laughs> over and, uh, and look what happened. And, uh, you know, it's uh, Ireland was one of the, just one of the most important early Christian centres in in Europe, certainly Northern Europe, anyway. So yeah, it's... I mean, but you see, the, again, from an integralist perspective, Ireland in nineteen twenties and thirties and forties and fifty had the perfect kind of integration of church and state mm-hmm. that should have preserved the faith forever, but it didn't work. You know, <laughs> either the, the faith is is preserved by its own. <laughs> dynamic or it's not going to be preserved by the state i mean i don't think i'm pessimistic in well i think that's true and i think also from my impression here um the reaction against the church is 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 because of the, the power that the church had over society exactly. it had so much power to, to everything from education to you know people's moral upbringing so that when people rebel against that 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 those values they rebel against the church they see the church as an oppressor um mm-hmm. So yeah, it, it sort of backfires if you're not careful. I think that's what happened in Britain as well over a, over a longer period. I mean, the, the Anglican Church was not that <laughs> harsh, I don't think. But anyway. no, the Anglican Church is, is, is no, the Anglican Church has always been very kind of wobbly in the middle of the road. But it was still Mellow, always, right? always associated with a certain type of morality which people threw off after the '60s, and then no one wanted to hear from the church again. And the church can't decide, it's never been able to decide in Britain whether it wants to be down with the modern world or whether it wants to resist it. And so it's tried to do a bit of both and then it's just, it ends up with the worst of both worlds. So, yeah. <laughs> but, you know, you never know what might happen. We'll see. <clears throat> so one thing I um, was so intrigued by in bringing you together was the fact that you come from such diverse backgrounds, as it were, and even with Carlo's background in mathematics, and that's his day job, as it were, in contrast to your more literary background, Paul. So I want to ask you a little bit each of those, if I may, and how that impacts your faith and things like that. So first of all, if I might ask you, Carlo, in your conversation with Alex Cassida, I think you beautifully described the kind of relationship between faith and doubt, which is taken on new dimensions uh, according to people like Charles Taylor in a secular age that uh, people of faith have a temptation constantly to doubt and the converse is true then. So um, I suppose as it pertains to the God who we most often don't see then, 
Carlo, how does your interest in um, work in mathematics and the kind of sublimity of mathematics that people talk about, which itself seems often to be invisible and intangible, um, does that ha- help you appreciate God more? And if so, well, how? Does that make sense? Yeah, my, my first degree was in physics. And what I always found super fascinating is how the, the world of nature is imbued with mathematical structures. Okay, I mean, um, of course, we, we only have our own approximations of these mathematical structures. But, you know, the fact that you study how a gas behaves and then there is this profound, beautiful mathematical model is a beautiful thing. You know, I mean, it's just... Uh, that's the appeal that drives scientists that there is a certain beauty in the this this the stru- the, the quantitative structuring of nature and of course it's not that you need to be a mathematician to appreciate a beautiful sunset or a beautiful aurora but uh, it's an additional dimension when you when you when you when you realize the again that the mathematical regularities that are embedded in, in that beauty is a beautiful thing to discover, a beautiful thing to, to see. And so, I mean, uh, physics is a contemplative aspect and science in general. Uh, so I, I don't think that, you know, the average, the great scientists like Einstein or again, Maxwell or Poincaré or Newton, they were driven by the desire for technological domination. Okay? I mean, this is kind of a late narrative that science is all about um, producing technology, but the great scientists, usually they were driven more by a, a curiosity, by a, by, a, and by an aesthetic appeal. So I mean, that, that's, I think, is the way it should work. And there is nothing wrong then with putting science to use, even technologically, within the right boundaries, but uh, um, the original impulse is a contemplative impulse, I think. Excellent. Thanks, Carlo. And um, even recently, Jordan Peterson have talked about the hierarchy in which science must be embedded. Did you have to start with that notion of the universe as intelligible and it it has that value that you actually want to conduct experiments in order to come to the truth and you're even willing to sacrifice your kind of theories on the altar of truth, as it were, because you have this implicit um, understanding of the world as truthful, <laughs> for lack of a better word. Um, does that make sense? I think that's a really good insight. It's a good insight that he's sharing with people who I suppose have just taken it for granted that science is a good thing. They don't know why, and they don't know why we bother to do science at all. I suppose that as that scales, then is it fair to say that, um, like there's a, there's a book by Hannum, I think it is, that suggests that we have the modern scientific method, modern, I don't know if that's, that's the right word, precisely because the medieval Christian mind understood. Mm-hmm. That it's the creation that's intelligible that all makes sense I mean uh, people are not uh, surprised enough by the fact that modern science was born from medieval Europe and early modern Europe it was not born in China China was much better prepared or India India the great mathematical tradition China the very organized uh, state with bureaucrats and schools and uh, but why did science, I think science benefited a lot from a, a culture that was believed that the reality is infused with the logos, you know, that the reality is infused with the rationality, because that's without that uh, conviction, nobody would even try to be a scientist. Thanks, Carlo. And uh, I wonder then, Paul, do you have something similar, especially as it pertains to the written word and the structure of stories and so on? Does that make sense? Yeah, possibly. I mean, I think probably what I do is, well, what I do is very intuitive. Um, uh, I don't have a, I don't have a scientific mind, shall we say. I definitely have an inquiring mind, but not a scientific one. Um, and so for me, I suppose writing has just been, well, it's, it's been, it's, it's I was going to say it's been a, a form of self-expression, which it has. Um, but more than that, it's a form of exploration 
in the same way that science is, I suppose, in that sense, that um, certainly in non-fiction anyway, not so much in fiction, but certainly in my non-fiction, I'm writing to find out what I think. Um, I broadly understand what I think. I broadly know what my intuitions are, but the kind of writing I'm doing at the moment in my series on Substack, for example, where I'm reading a lot of writers, many of whom I hadn't read before, like Del Noche, um, and they are refining my thinking or they're changing my mind on some things. They're helping me to understand this crisis, this, this crisis of modernity, what the world is, is, is experiencing. Well, since I was young, I've been able to intuit that there seemed to be something very badly broken about the relationship that we have with the natural world, with our culture. I didn't know what it was, but something wasn't right. And I've spent most of my life exploring it, and I just do it in words because I like words, and I'm, I've turned that. You know, I've I've written enough of them that I've got reasonably good at making them fit together. Um, and I've always been a reader, and I've always loved stories. And all of these things that we're talking about fundamentally are stories, you know. And it's it's the way that those stories are communicated. I don't mean stories in the sense that they're false. I mean stories in the sense that they have a narrative. What a nation is is a narrative. What a religion is is a narrative. The story of God is a narrative. The story of what a human being is is a narrative. As I say, I don't mean in the sense that it isn't true, but in the sense that you have to construct stories to be able to explain things to people. It's what the Bible is. It's a collection of stories, some mythical, some more journalistic, but they're giving us a pattern of reality. That's how we communicate. Um, a lot of the stories that we tell in, our, in, in modernity are broken away from the source. They're broken away from the truth. They're broken away from God because they have, like the rest of the culture, become very narcissistic and inward focused and self-centered and so the only stories that we seem to be able to tell now are stories about our our kind of inner pain or our turmoil or what's wrong with the world um but again classically stories are telling much bigger tales about what it means to be human what it means to have a quest what it means to have a relationship with god um all of these things that that, that come out in all the kind of great myth cycles so there's something about storytelling that is part of the part of the process of trying to regain our footing you know in a world that's sane and real so i suppose i'm, I'm sort of that sounds very grandiose but i'm sort of i'm poking at that somehow with my words well that's brilliant thanks paul and um actually if i might ask you <clears throat> recently jordan peterson again had douglas murray on he's talking with jonathan pajot and um one of the elements that I thought was interesting was the way jo Jonathan approaches the, the resurrection, for for instance, is really interesting. He is very adamant that we return to understanding it as a narrative again, not that it's false, but that in the modern world we tend to become so obsessed with the kind of scientific details that... Um, that the Bible itself actually doesn't focus on with the, the resurrection stories and things like that, that the point is obviously way beyond our modern conception of science. And um, it sort of, when, I thought that was interesting, but it sort of went into where Murray assumed that Pajot's understanding of the universe would then be contradictory but is is it fair to say that that it's paradoxical that once we reach far enough that we we arrive at a paradox? I was thinking about this. You might be able to tell me, Carlo, on this end, that um, even science itself, if you look at the uncertainty principle or Goodell's incom incompleteness theorem, things like that, there, there seems to be even within this the story of science itself this. Um, the, the the science point, points beyond itself and suggests paradox and this narrative element. Does that make sense? And then and in the literary world, that seems to be something that uh, G.K. Chesterton, again, was very focused on the Prince of Paradox, they call him. Does that make sense? <laughs> well, I mean, um, yeah, it makes sense. I mean, Paradoxical. I mean, I would say that there is always the mystery that that every, every in, in every direction you push, you push two inches, and then <laughs> the, you hit some sort of wall. You know, what I mean, in the sense that reality is always bigger than us, always 
exorbitant and, and, and the experience of science is that you discover one thing and that thing reveals to you nine things you don't know. I mean, that's the constant experience of a scientist. The, the, the more you investigate, the less you understand. <laughs> I mean, you do, you do understand some things, but again, you open always new vistas that you don't understand. And, and, and so this fundamental experience of the mystery, is, I think Einstein said that, is, uh, is constitutional of the scientific experience. Uh, this, of course, is not part of the popular knowledge about science. I think that science has figured out everything there is to figure out, which is not true. So, I mean, ultimately, you have to live in this position of curiosity, of openness, and, 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 and it never ends. You know, there is this open-endedness of the scientific enterprise, which is absolutely essential. It seems to me that the way we usually understand the scientific enterprise is not in that way. And that's one reason that science and religion seem to be in conflict all the time, because it seems to me that they're not inherently in conflict if you assume, as you've just said, that there's a mystery there. And so there are going to be things we don't understand yet and maybe never will. But if you don't take that attitude, it's impossible to, for example, talk about the resurrection, Mark, as you were just suggesting because obviously that's apparently scientifically impossible according to the way we understand the world at the moment so people you can get very easily stuck on that um, you can get stuck on miracles you can get stuck on any of these kind of physical realities as opposed to standing back and looking at the meaning of the story um, what's going on here how is this happening um, what does it mean that it's happening what are we trying to tell ourselves when we tell these stories? And again, not in the sense that the stories are made up, because otherwise there would be no point in telling them at all, but that there's something going on here that we're not capable of understanding with the, with the rational mind. And so there must be another way of understanding it. And there's probably a reason that that story has lasted for 2,000 years. And it's not just that people didn't know what they were doing and they didn't have science. There's something else happening um, that can be conveyed through the stories. And one of the things that I find so entrancing about the gospels is that so many of the disciples are endlessly having trouble understanding this and some of them are doubting it and saying what the hell's going on and having to have everything explained to them and jesus regularly gets impatient with them and can't <laughs> can't understand why they can't just un it's very clear what he's trying to tell them and they don't get it because they're they're so representative of the way that that we treat the story now um we're, we're kind of all we're, we're kind of all thomas now understandably um so there's yeah there's 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 something about the, the you know the narrative of that story the greatest story ever told as they used to call it is what makes the is what communicates the mystery of it there's something that's given to us through the way that the story is told um, and like the science that Carlo is talking about you have to leave some you have to leave a lot that's open that you can't explain you can't fill it in you can't write it, an ending that ties up all the loose ends because you can't you can't tie them up. But that's an omission of humility. You have to then say there's a lot of stuff we don't know here, and we don't we don't like doing that. <laughs> it's not yeah, comfortable. I, yeah, I will add that uh, you know the conflict of science and religion is itself a story. It's a story that can kind of, it is the story of a certain branch of the French Enlightenment that you know modernity is this motion away from superstition in which the good guys is called science and the bad guy is called religion, and this caricature has a certain narrative power, which is still enduring, but has very little to do either with what people of faith do or what scientists do. It's just an ideological narrative that people came up with and which is still gives meaning to many people. Many people think that I'm on the side of science, you know, and they get a comfort and, and a sense maybe of even superiority by the fact that they are not uh, on the side of religion. You know, it, it is like a Western movie with the, with the cowboys and the Indians. So it's, it shouldn't be taken too seriously because it is essentially ideological. Uh, also, another brief comment is that, you know, um, uh, exactly because Christianity is a story, right? It's not a set of dogmas, it's not a set of moral principle, but it happened as the experience of the disciples. Uh, it must keep happening as the experience of the disciples, right? I mean, and, and, and this, I think, is a very Catholic, also Orthodox, but I will stand for the Catholic side of it, uh, that, uh, that we know Christianity through the experience of uh, the present life of the church. If, it wasn't, if the story was not still happening, 
we would never relate to 2000 years ago, right? You cannot relate to a story without being part of it. Uh, and this again is one other possible weakness in our response to modernity. If we try to reimpose a set of truths and doctrines and ethical principles and even theological dogmas without relieving them, you know, I mean, and that this is really the challenge when I was talking earlier about not to give a reactive or uh, just doctrinaire response to modernity has to become, again, a form of experience, which was one another word much used by the late Fire Giussani. Either Christianity is experienced as an event in the present or forget about it. It's mm -hmm. not, you know, things are not going to change. And yeah, um, really, really Sorry, go on, Mark. No, I was just going to say that reminds me of what Simone Weil said about the Eucharist. She said, um, if it's just a symbol, then to hell with it. I thought that was quite Flannery good. O'Connor. Flannery O'Connor. <laughs> Sorry? Flannery O'Connor said that. Oh, really? Oh, not yet. Simone Weil. You're right. You're, sorry, you're right. Sorry, that was Flannery O'Connor, yes. But it's, um, yeah, the, the sentiment stands. <laughs> right. Um, another element that I think dovetails with what we just spoke about there, I don't know if you're either if you're familiar with, with um there's an Orthodox priest, kind of polymath, brilliant literary man, scientist, uh, Father Pavel Florensky. And he has this really interesting idea that really helped me to get at this mystery where he describes kind of God's hiddenness or God's uh, invisibility for the most part to us as such a wonderful grace because it allows space for our freedom that he doesn't just reveal himself uh, <clears throat> as a kind of for formula that we can easily understand so that we can enter into a relationship of trust with him, with um, then, of course, people like Thomas in history being the exception rather than the rule. So, yes, he got, he got the touch. But then isn't there that verse in Scripture that talks about um, blessed are those who haven't seen uh, something along those lines? I wonder what you might each say to that or... Mm, blessed are those who haven't seen and yet yet still believe. Mm. Yeah, yeah, I suppose so. I mean, I, I'm I'm actually very I'm very struck by what Carlo just said about the experience. That seems to get to the heart of it, um, the need to relentlessly experience this, um, and the fact that it is a, an experience rather than a set of rules or dogmas, which seems to me to be exactly the way to talk about it. I mean, I'm quite a new Christian, so I'm still working out how to talk about it um, and how to how to think about it. Which, which is not to undermine the dogmas, right? Don't no, get me wrong. I mean, they're, they're still but there. But the, the dogmas are a condens. If the dogmas are not a condensation of something experienced, they would be arbitrary. You know, the dogma of Chalcedon, people had to reconcile the experience that Jesus was a man and he was more than a man, right? Mm. You, you live with those two polarities, you have to reconcile them. You come up with two natures uh, confused, united but not confused, you know, but then the dogma will stand for the next 2,000 years. But the, if if the disciples had not experienced the two natures of Christ, nobody would have come up with the dogma, you know what I mean? And, so, and of course, you know, in, in the modern world, unfortunately, experience takes a very subjectivist sense, you know, which, uh, uh, especially in America, every time I talk about these things, people t think I'm Protestant. <laughs> but it, 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 it's not um, true. It's not a matter of feeling. It's not a matter of something that you subjectively feel. It's just a matter of something that you have in front of yourself and that you experience as real. Otherwise, uh, you quickly lose the thread. You know? mm. And the dogma has to be in service to the experience. That's the point. As a protection, the dogma is really a protection of the experience, mm -hmm. because typically, you know, like Little Bach used to say, heresy is when you try to split apparently conflicting truth, mm -hmm. like one and three, God and man. You know, there are uh, grace and freedom. You know, Christianity is riddled with these things that are mysterious. That if you oversimplify, you have to give up half of the picture, right? Also, Newman says the same thing. So, a heretic is always somebody who embraces half a truth. Hmm, interesting. Do, you, do either of you gents have any other burning questions then that you'd like to ask before we go? I think we've just solved all the problems of modernity. <laughs> um, so we, should be, we should be fine. Um, no, I, I, well, I don't, 
Uh, Thanks for the conversation. It was a yeah, fun no, conversation. It's, it's very, very interesting. It's, um, I mean, I think one of the questions that I, I one of the questions that comes through relentlessly in, in, in my writing and people's response to my writing is always this: What do we do? What do we do? You know, here we are in the in the crisis of modernity. What do we do? It can very easily lead to despair. It can lead to right. anger. Yeah. It can lead to division. I will, I will quote once, a once more time I, the priest I mentioned before, the Italian priest Giussani, he once came to New York to talk and he was sitting there with an American Monsignor and he gave all this beautiful talk and the Monsignor then, okay, Father, that's great, but we in America, we want to know, what do we do? <laughs> that's that's, really, question. Yeah. That, that, that's really a very practical American question. And, yeah. and Giussani explained very to him. Very important question. All right, and Giussani explained, no, the right question is not what do we do, but who are we? Right. If you know who you are, you will know what to do. And who you are means what you have met, what you have experienced, what you believe, what whom do you rely on, who are your friends. There are all these questions that are summarized. Is who am I, who are we? Okay. If you have that clear, you will do the right thing. And so he went on and gave a beautiful answer for 20 minutes. And then the American Monsignor said, oh, that's beautiful, Monsignor Sunny, but I still don't know what to do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I, I'm, I'm making fun of American pragmatists, but you know what I mean? It's just... Oh, no, it's, it's relentless. It's not just an American thing either. It's very much a, it's the, it's the question of a political activist or anyone who, right. anyone modern, we all, we all have that question. We're all kind of born with that question, aren't we? It right. comes back to Del Noche again, you know, we're supposed to come up with, come up with a plan, have a political idea, have a revolution, have a technology. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Something's going to exactly. solve the problem of being for Exactly, us. but it is, in a sense, it's a superficial question, isn't it? I mean, mm, the, the deep is. question is, who am I? What am I doing here? Yeah. You, know, the, you know, the great American writer was that very clearly is Walker Percy. I don't know if you ever read Walker Percy. Yes. Mm. Perfect understanding of this part. So yeah. that is the answer. That is the answer. Who are we and how should we be is the answer then, isn't it? That's the that's the, that's the approach. And that goes back to the uh, conv that, that, what we were saying earlier about going inward. Uh, you know? Who is my father? Who is generating me? You know, there, there are all these foundational questions that are no longer asked. Mm. Just asking those questions mm. makes a huge difference in my opinion. Mm, that's a lifetime's work. And um, then, folks, where can viewers or listeners find out more about you and the work that you're doing? And if I might start with you, Paul. Um, well, um, I suppose I'm, the, the writing I'm doing at the moment is on my Substack page, which is a couple of... Uh, I'm doing a series of essays pretty much about the crisis of modernity. It's, it's never-ending. Um, it's like a Sisyphean task, um, and it's called the Abbey of Misrule, and uh, you can sign up to that if you want. But I also have a website, paulkingsnorth.net, which has got a lot of my past writings on, and it's all free, and you can browse through that. Or you can buy any of my books, which I'd highly recommend and encourage at all, at all times, if you want to. Thanks, Paul. And I should say, too, that uh, we still have some tickets available for Benbury Prairie, where you can join Paul, myself, Martin, King, Martin Shaw, and... Uh, a number of other people in November. So no, that's 26th, Saturday, 26th of November. Hmm. And uh, I'll link a little description for, uh, uh, I'll, do, uh, I'll share a link in the description for people who are interested in that. And then yourself, Carlo. Oh, well, you know, I uh, I translated these three books by an obscure Italian philosopher you can read, but they're kind of dense. If you want to read them, start with the one. The first one called The Crisis of Modernity is the most approachable. The other two are for lovers and uh, i recommend them but you need to have a develop a taste for them i do some writing from time to time i'm not systematically i'm not a professional writer so but if you google my name you can find some stuff i've written here and there maybe you can read some of it thank you so much for your time today gentlemen god bless you both yeah thank you really thank good you to for having you. us thank you it was beautiful Nobody gets